Hi, welcome to another edition of Loremaker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm Sherry Heiberg, the archivist. If you've never seen Loremaker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's a program in which me and uh, the other writers get together, or more like do it solo, one at a time, talk about the lore behind the systems that we have built for you, the citizens of the stars. <laughs> Wrong show. <laughs> Wrong show. Anyway, this is Alarm Maker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I hope you enjoy this tour of Callus. Now, I picked Callus because I thought it would be interesting to talk about a system that's still forming. Um, here is our representation of Callus. Um, if our visualization was where we would want it to be, we'd have a more accurate representation of a protoplanetary disk, which has, you know, lots of little planetesimals, little planet embryos, some dust, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and we hope to do that with the next iteration of the star map. Star map. So systems like Callus and Null and Gerzel will have the appropriate protoplanetary disks, which will uh, be a more compelling visualization, in my opinion. Uh, now, the Kala system, even though it doesn't have any life developing on it whatsoever, is protected by the Fair Chance Act. And the reason for this is that it is a developing system in that it is developing slowly on an astronomical scale, like millions of years. It's going to take millions of years for the system to finish forming and to become a full nine-planet solar system, more or less similar to ours, which is you know, at the heart of it, the reason why the Senate agreed to pass the Fair Chance Act and protect this, this uh, otherwise uninteresting system. But I think it's pretty interesting because it's scientifically interesting, and so do all the people who live here and study it. There has been a push ever since the announcement of the discovery of the planet in uh, 2291. Uh, no, not 2291. Why did I say that? in 2921 that there are land deeds available up for grabs and that once Callus finishes developing it's going to be a hub of interesting jump points and there's going to be cheap land available for everyone, mining prospects, etc. But as I said, systems like this take millions of years to develop. So anyone who comes up to you claiming that they have a good deal on a land deed for Callus probably also has a really good collection of snake oil they'd like to show you. Not to mention the fact that you can't actually buy land in systems protected by the Fair Chance Act, so be on the lookout for charlatans such as that. This is the star of Callus, also called Callus. It's a G-type main sequence star. It burns yellow-white on the spectral scale, much like our sun. It's called a yellow dwarf. A lot of the stars along the main sequence are dwarf stars, but they're not white dwarfs. Uh, like uh, the red dwarf is the M-type star, it burns very cool, it's very old. Then you have the K-type star that burns orange, it's a little bit warmer, and then you have the G-type star, the yellow dwarf, which is our sun. Which is partially one of the things that made this system so interesting to people who wanted to study the long-term development of a system in its infancy. This guy is Callus one we hope to get a better representation of a forming planet one day, but for now we went with something that, in, that sort of suggests that it's, it's, it hasn't got an atmosphere, it's got a little rocky surface, it's forming from close by planetesimals, it's kind of a little planetoid. Um, one day it will coalesce into a bigger planet, but for now it is what it is. We've also got the Callus Belt Alpha, which is very thick, for an asteroid belt, very dense, full of minerals, full of, as I said, asteroids. Decently dangerous to fly through. You want to be careful and make sure that you calculate that your ship, if you indeed need to pass through it, does not run into any of the asteroids that are going quickly through the belt. Here we have, interestingly enough, Callus 3. Callus 3, and whoop, here's the other guy. Callus 2 are also forming planets, much less Callus 1, but in this case they share the same orbit in a not exactly eternally stable pattern. One day they are probably going to crash into each other, which I hope that we get to see in game, but who knows. Uh, and once they do, uh, it is fair game to bet which 
planet will subsume the other, whether they will pulverize each other, or whether we will get an Earth-Moon situation, which I think would be the raddest outcome. Here we have another asteroid belt. Unlike the Alpha belt, the Beta belt is actually really sparse. Again, our visualization hasn't caught up to what our lore wants to communicate, but one day we hope that it will. We'd love to have different visualizations of different kinds of belts so that you can tell at a glance whether it is densely populated or whether it is more like a dust belt, which is what Callus belt, Callus beta here is. Oh, Callus belt beta. All right, now that we've talked about these, let's move on to Callus 4 if I can find it. Let's see, where are you, my guy? I see Callus 6. Oh, here we go, Callus 4. Callus 4 is firmly within the green band, which is very exciting to scientists. It is molten, which is also very exciting to, to scientists, and it's roughly in the same position as our Earth, which is the most exciting thing for scientists. It's sort of like getting a photograph or a live, more like a live feed of the formation of Earth at a certain time in its history. Um, after a couple of million years, it may stabilize and cool off and get a hard surface, uh, perhaps with volcanic activity, perhaps with oceans. It all remains to be seen, but it is in a prime position to develop life should the planet stabilize. This will, of course, take millions of years, and it's unlikely for the scientists observing this system to possibly see it in their lifetimes, which they know, but they are still very happy to be here to observe this fantastic, um, fantastic slice of astronomical history. All right. Now let's zoom out for a second so I can get a hold on where I've put where we've put Callus 5. So we have Callus 5 here, which is a young rocky planet. It's not quite finished forming and it has a healthy disk of uh, debris around it, which hopefully and possibly will one day coalesce into a moon or several moons. And that is what evidence, evidence suggests and that would also be extremely exciting to observe on a long-term scale. We also have Callus 6 all the way on the other side here. This is Callus 6. It is a carbon planet, as you can see from the scoring and having seen a lot of carbon planets in my time. It, uh, <laughs> it formed out of a protoplanetary disk debris field that's composed mostly of carbon. And it just sits pretty. It is almost done with its development. And I guess if you want carbon and want to defy the law, come to Callus 6. Here's Callus 7. It's a gas giant. Now what I found very interesting when I was reading about protoplanetary disks is that gas giants tend to form much faster than their terrestrial counterparts. So Callus 7 is a fully formed adult gas planet with its own credit cards and bills and apartment. It's thinking about getting a dog. It's a great place to go if you want to refuel, if you happen to be going through the system, and refueling is not against the law here. It is a big, hydrogen-rich, grown-up system, a perfect for your refueling needs. And what I like to think from this little visualization of the dots around it is that they're a bunch of tiny moons. That's what I hope to have once we get the system online for you, the players. A bunch of tiny moons that form from a big protoplanetary disk that's still circling around the planet. I very much hope that all my visualizations dreams will come true in the next iteration of the star map. Let us move on from Callus 7 to Callus 8. Callus 8 is an ice giant. It is composed of heavier elements than the elements of the gas giant that precedes it. So there is a prevailing hypothesis that it formed closer to the sun and then was flung outward early in its development stage. Um, this most likely would have happened before the other planets on the inner orbit between it and the sun formed because otherwise an event of that magnitude may have flung the other smaller planets, by smaller by mass planets out of the system. But everything appears to be in its place, much like our solar system. Uh, it is possible that an event like this may have influenced the orbits of Callus 2 and 3, but that is again a hypothesis. It's not even a theory yet. So let's move on to the last planet in the system, which you may recognize from our Tanya Oriel tale, Lost Generation. 
Callus 9. So let's zoom out because it's pretty far out there. Callus 9 is a dwarf planet covered with active cryovolcanoes. So that in common parlance is volcanoes that shoot ice, which I think is pretty awesome. Tanya Oriel, who we envision as a character in the Star Citizen universe, came here as a part of a job that she took to investigate possible remains of the Artemis, the long lost colony ship. Uh, it is possible that she found remains of a ship here, but there has been no evidence discovered of such a thing ever happening. Perhaps one day we can ask Tanya Oriel herself what happened. And if you are interested in catching up on the story, please check out Lost Generation. I think it's a pretty good one. And moving on to the last feature in the system is observational post Griffin. I may have to zoom, oh, there it is, there it is. Right here, this is the observational post of the system that, ser that serves as the central location for the army that's charged with monitoring Callus to make sure that no one comes in and sets up an illegal mining operation or decides to have some kind of black market settlement on one of the forming planets or maybe sets up a weird pirate base in the asteroid field, all kinds of things that you could illegally do in the system that the army does not want you to do. It's also the base for the scientists who are observing the system in its formation, so it's full of grad students, postdocs, um, their supervisors, and a rather young contingent of the army. People from all walks of life are invited to come to the scientific outpost to observe the system, so you also get weird new age people, you get folks who are interested just on a casual basis about the formation of the universe. And so if you want an interesting conversation, the observational station Griffin is a great place to go. However, you have to keep in mind as scientists that it is very, it's a long term data driven observational exercise and spectacular sites such as planets crashing into one another are not likely to occur. So the, the scientists here are a little bored and often in need of distraction. So parties happen, ben, uh, benders happen, all kinds of things happen there. It's a good place. And that does it for Callus, the system that is still in the early stages of its formation. It's almost done. It's kind of a teenage system with a couple of adult planets scattered in here. I like it very much, and I hope you liked it very much. Thank you again for tuning in to Loremaker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.